Hi there. Welcome to lecture seven of machine learning from data, approximation versus generalization. Now, just to recap, the last few lectures have been a tour de force of math and theory to establish that, you know, even for infinite hypothesis sets, we can get this link from E in to E out. Now, how did we accomplish that? We introduced this uh, effective number of hypotheses, the growth function, which is polynomially bounded for good hypothesis sets. And that gives us this link from E in to E out. For bad hypothesis sets, you're out of luck. You know, there's a lot of theory out there. And we chose this particular blend of theory. Why? Well, first, it has withstood the test of time. Second, establishes this fundamental link from E into E out, and we only care about E out. And third, this theory has relevance to practice. I mean, if you violate the assumptions of this theory, you will feel it in practice. So it is relevant theory. It's not just space-filling abstract theory. And, um, you know, embedded in this theory, well, first of all, is the concept of a good and a bad hypothesis set. Second of all is this concept of approximation versus generalization, the tug of war between E in and E out. You want a large hypothesis set to get E in small, you want a small hypothesis set to, to get E in close to E out, and you need to balance this tug of war. Okay. So, so, so you need to choose, there are choices to be made, and, and, and this gives us a theory, a principled way to make those choices. So we'll dig a little bit deeper in this theory. We'll introduce, we'll introduce you to the concept of a VC dimension. Then we'll study approximation versus generalization and the, uh, new other, another way to view that uh, whole uh, concept, which is the bias variance analysis. So, you know, I worked hard. I did some hardcore theory. Here I have a nice technical result for you. So I feel I've earned the right to preach. So let me preach a little. Okay? And in my preaching, I'm going to remind you of this ancient you know, Persian saying, okay, which goes as follows. He who knows and knows it is wise, follow him. He who knows and knows it not is asleep, wake him. Okay. He who knows not and knows it is a student, teach him. He who knows not and knows it not is a fool, avoid him. Okay. So now I want to just, you know, you know, I mean, I, 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 I wrote in red the guy who, you know, who knows nothing and, but thinks you know, they know everything, so knows not that they know nothing. That's the dangerous guy. Okay. On the other hand, what we would like to interact with, you know, are people who know, you know, and they know they know. Okay. You know, it's very dangerous to come upon this red guy. Okay. And this, a similar situation occurs in machine learning. Okay. And that's sort of what the theory established. Now, you know, we did all this theory, and in practice, there's a tendency for, th for theory to go by the wayside. You know, people, you know, we, 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 we tend to have the sort of impression, ah, theory, theory, all this math, yeah. you know, is, is it worth anything? Does it have any relevance to practice? Okay. Or is it just a paralysis by analysis kind of situation? Okay. And so, you know, I want to sort of emphasize that when it comes to learning, that's a mistake to throw the theory by the wayside. Now, it may be that, you know, when you're practicing, someone else has done the theory for you and selected a good hypothesis set with this and that property. Essentially, what they're doing is they're establishing this link between E in and E out. Okay. And, you know, it's very important, sort of, I cannot emphasize more that, you know, you know, there's the side of the world that we can see. So, in sample, and there's the side of the world that we cannot see. So, out of sample. And on this side lives E in, and on this side lives E out. Okay, and you will never know E out. So this is a black, you know, thick, in, impenetrable curtain. You will never know E out. Okay, all, and, and that's why it's very tempting, you know, it's very easy, it's very concrete to just go and take E in and minimize it, send it, send it to zero. And anyone can do that. I mean, okay, you might need to skillfully manipulate your, your way through a hypothesis set or something like that. But, you know, at least in feasible, it's a concrete task and we can accomplish it. Okay? But when it comes to learning, it accomplishes nothing. Okay? It's just memorizing the data. Okay? What we really care about is this thing that we cannot see. Okay? And so the theory builds this link. Okay? And that link is very important because now if we have this link, we can go ahead and minimize the concrete thing. So when you approach a machine learning problem, you know, one of two things will happen, okay? And this is what we discussed last time. One of two things will happen. You will either say, someone gives you the data, you do your stuff, you will either go back to them and say, I did it. In other words, I, you know, I learned and here, 
here's a final hypothesis G, go. You can deploy it safely or you will tell the guy, I failed. And it's important to realize that it must be possible to fail in a machine learning problem. Okay. It's not possible to guarantee success. Okay. And you know, you will say one of these things and in either case, with high probability, whatever you say will be correct with high probability. Now, we don't know ahead of time which of these you are more likely to say. It depends on how good of a machine learning person you are, how skillful you are at choosing the hypothesis set and the features and whatnot. Okay. And, you know, and also, you know, what kinds of target functions are you attacking? If, if all you ever attack are the world's most complex target functions, you will often say you failed. Okay. And if you fail, you fail. The point is, you will say one of these things and with high probability, you will be correct. And, you know, in some sense, you know, that places you into these blue categories in this same. Okay, so what the theory says, okay, so you will look and you will see that E is, 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 is close to zero. So you think that you have learned, okay, you, 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 you think that you have learned, so... Okay, you think that you have learned, and it is indeed the case that E out is approximately equal to E in. So not only do you think that you have learned, you know, you, you, you c consider yourself to have learned, but it is indeed the case that you have learned because your E in matches to your E out. Okay, so this is what the theory says. And, and in that situation, you'll say, I did it. Okay. In the other situation that might occur, E out, sorry, E in, is let's say much greater than zero, but you still maintain E out is approximately equal to E in. Okay. And so in this situation, you know, your E out is large, so you, you haven't learned, you know not, you haven't learned, but you know that you know not. So what the theory of learning sort of establishes is that with high probability, you'll be in one of these two blue worlds, which are good. Okay. I mean, ideally, you'd like to be in the top blue world, but at least in the bottom blue world, you know, you're not conning yourself into thinking that you have learned. Okay. And you go and perform a disaster in deployment, which is what this red world is. Okay. So the crucial thing that the theory of learning est uh, establishes is that it allows us to avoid this disastrous red world where, you know, in this red world, e in is approximately equal to zero, but E out is much, much bigger than zero. You know not, but you think you know. It's a disaster. Okay. Now, you know, you know, it's, it, it's possible that with some probability, you know, you can also get into this world with low probability. So what the theory of learning establishes is that with high probability, you will be in one of these worlds. With, it, with high probability, you will either, you know, say that you failed, and indeed you did fail, so your E out is large, or you will say that you succeeded, and indeed you did succeed, so your E out will be small. Okay, we don't know which of these worlds will happen, but whatever world happens, you will be correct in whatever conclusion you make. Okay. And then, if this world happens, oh, bingo, you can go and deploy your system. Okay, so... Um, Let's now talk about, let's get a little bit more into the weeds and talk about this formula that we established last time. Okay, so let me erase. Give myself some space. And, um, okay, so theoretically, what did we accomplish? Or mathematically, what did we accomplish? We said that there's a link between E in and E out, and the strength of that link is determined by this error bar, and this link holds for any H, for any F, for any um, P of X that generates the data, for any um, algorithm that picks a G from your H. I mean, look at that. Completely, completely general. 
Okay. But now let's dig a little bit deeper, okay, because this, this formula is a little bit cryptic. It has some notation that is, is not standard in other fields of mathematics. Okay. So in particular, there's this growth function m sub h of 2n. Okay. So what we also show is that there are two kinds of hypotheses sets. So two kinds of h. Okay. So the bad kind, bad. Okay, and what is the bad kind? The bad hypothesis set is the hypothesis set that never gets broken. So, you know, any data set size, so, so, so a million data points, it's possible that the hypothesis set will be able to implement all dichotomies on those million data points. Okay, so bad H, so H never gets broken. Okay, so this means that m sub h of n is equal to 2 to the n for all n greater than equal to 1. Okay, and in this case, the error bar is, is basically the error bar, so we call this the generalization error bar. And in this case, the generalization error bar is basically, you know, is, is, so, uh, let's call this the generalization back error bar omega. So in this case, omega is equal to, you know, the square root of 8 over n log uh, 4 times uh, 2n to the 2n. So, so, sorry, 2 to the 2n. So 2 to the 2n because it's n, m sub h of 2n. Okay, so 2 to the 2n over delta. And you see that if delta is small, so okay, so what, what's the term that depends on n here? Log of you know, 2 to the 2n, so you get a 2n, so this is, you know, equal to the square root, forgetting about these constants, it's equal to 16n log 2 divided by n, okay, plus some other terms, okay, but this term is already big, and so this makes this error bar basically big, big bigger than 1, so the, the error bar is trivial, and it doesn't go to 0 with large n. Okay. And so what that means is that for this bad hypothesis set, you don't get a link, a useful link between E in and E out. So whatever E in you observe, we can't make any guarantees with high probability about the corresponding E out. Okay. So there are two kinds of H. There's the bad kind. Okay, but now let's focus on the good kind. Okay, there's the good kind. Yes. And for the good kind, and this is what's an, a, sort of, this is a mathematically interesting fact that emerged. There's, there's the bad kind, and the bad kind is very bad. Okay. And then there's the good kind, and the good kind is very good. There's nothing in between. And what do we mean by very good? M sub H of N, okay, is polynomial. So there's nothing in between. You're either 2 to the n, and 2 to the n is 2 to the n. You can, so it's this specific exponential, not 2 to the n over 2, not, not you know, 2 to the uh, log squared n. So, so no, no alternative, but this specific exponential or polynomial. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, a division, a, a, a very clean division of hypothesis sets into those that do not work and those that work. In other words, the growth function is polynomial. Okay, and what did we prove? That we proved that if there is a breakpoint, then m sub h of n is at most the sum from i equals zero. If there's a breakpoint, let's call it k, then m sub h of n is at most, you know, the sum from i equals zero to k minus one of the the binomial coefficient n choose i and you know we showed or you can show by induction that you know this sum of binomial coefficients is at most mm, n to the k minus 1 plus 1 and so you know forgetting about the 1 because typically n is large k is large the breakpoint is large so this 1 is you know you can throw away this 1 and the bound still most of the time remains valid so this is approximately equal to n to the k minus 1 okay, where k is a breakpoint okay so it's a polynomial of degree Roughly speaking, k, okay. technically k minus 1. Okay, and what is a breakpoint? A breakpoint is a any number of data points, okay, it's a number of data points that you know that no matter how you arrange those data points, 
the hypothesis set H cannot shatter that data set. Okay, cannot implement all the dichotomies. Okay, so in this situation, let's look at the error bar. So the error bar omega is, you know, roughly speaking, um, ignoring all constants and so on, or, or, or being a bit sloppy in some sense, is roughly speaking 8, uh, is the square root of 8 over n, okay, the log of 4 over delta, so, you know, that I, I can break up this log of a product into the log of 4 over delta plus the log of m sub h of n. But what's the log of m sub h of n? Well, since I'm getting an upper bound here, I can use an upper bound on m sub h of n. Okay, so I can, I can choose for omega. I can choose to substitute in the upper bound for m sub h and the, and the bound stays valid. Okay, so I'll have a valid bound with an, um, with an error bar of the form, roughly speaking, 2n um log sorry log of 2n to the k minus 1 okay which is and that's equal to you know roughly speaking the square root of 8 uh times k minus 1 over n log n and okay there's a plus log 2 but ignoring constants and this goes to zero when n goes to infinity, so when n is large enough for a fixed k. Okay. And that k is fixed because it's the break point. Okay. And so we, when we observe this uh, error bar, we see that it goes to zero for large enough n, and that establishes, in principle, the feasibility of learning for a large enough data set, no matter what hypothesis set you have, as long as it has a break point. Okay. And, and what do you need? You need n to be much bigger than the breakpoint. Then this error bar is dropping to, uh, to zero. Okay. And then what that means is that you can conclude that e in is close to e out. And if you can conclude that e in is close to e out, then you go and see what's the best e in I can get. And then you make your decision. Did I, did, did I succeed or did I fail? Okay. Now, you know, it's clear that the best error bar is coming from the cheapest breakpoint. Okay. So if we, if it, so the cheapest breakpoint gives us the best error bar. And so in some sense, the cheapest breakpoint is an important parameter of a hypothesis set. In particular, the cheapest breakpoint minus one. So definition, definition. Okay, the VC dimension, VC, Vapnik Chervenentis, it's the same VC after whom this error bar, this bound is named. Okay, and you know, let me emphasize that, yes, you know, we could have showered you with way more mathematics and got more, you know, modern bounds that are slightly improved and so on and so forth. But you pretty much can't, you know, get much better than this bound. So this bound has stood the, has stood the test of time. Okay. So the VC dimension of a hypothesis set H is, is the is one less, less than the cheapest breakpoint. In other words, it's k minus one. So it's k minus one. Okay, or we can say k star minus one because we're gonna pick the cheapest breakpoint. So this, this bound holds for any breakpoint. Okay, and it makes sense to consider the smallest breakpoint and one less than that we define as the VC dimension. So in words, what is the VC dimension? In words, the VC dimension is the maximum number of data points that can be shattered. It's the maximum number of data points that can be shattered. Okay. In, okay. More specifically, if you have a number of data points n, okay, and it's greater than and, 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 and n, let's say n is less equal to dvc. So let's call this the let's call this vc dimension dvc. So let's call this vc dimension d. VC. So if you have a number of data points that's less than or equal to DVC, okay, it means that your hypothesis set could shatter them. There is an arrangement of endpoints which could be shattered. It means 
that each could shatter them. Your data. Okay, and if H can shatter your data, so I'll leave it as an exercise for you to show, if H can shatter your data, okay, your, the X values in your data, it means that, the, it, it means that, you know, you can get E in zero. Okay. If N is greater than DBC, this implies that there's no way H can shatter your data, no matter what your data. So here it's H could shatter your data, but if your data is peculiarly arranged, maybe it won't. Okay, but in, in the case where you have more data points than the VC dimension, H cannot shatter your data, no matter how they're arranged. Okay. So that's the definition of the VC dimension. It's coming out of this bound, and in particular, the bound on the growth function, which has you know, so, so now we can say that for, 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 for hypothesis sets with a, a, gro a growth, a, a breakpoint K, in particular, a cheapest breakpoint K star, okay, this bound, okay, so we, we can say that M sub H of N is less equal to N to the DVC plus 1. So the growth function is at most a polynomial where the order of the polynomial is the VC dimension. Okay. For the bad kind of hypothesis sets, we say that the VC dimension is infinity. So the VC dimension is infinity. Okay. And what we see is that in the VC dimension, we have sort of summarized the entire growth function, which is a function of n, okay, into a single parameter, the VC dimension, which in some sense captures the complexity of your hypothesis set. Okay. And let's do some examples of the VC dimension so that you get a sort of a feel for, for this VC dimension and you, 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 begin, you begin to appreciate you know, that it is indeed a measure of the complexity of a hypothesis set. It turns out it's the right measure from the perspective of learning. Okay, so examples. Examples. Examples of VC dimension. So let's consider all the hypothesis sets that we've been working with, with when we were discussing the growth function. So we have, you know, the 2D you know, perceptron, we have the 1D positive ray, and we have the 2D positive rectangle. Okay, so I'll put N here. So, um, N equals 1, so N equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. Okay. And for the 2D perceptron, we saw that you can implement the growth function is 2 to the n. The breakpoint, the 2D perceptron gets broken at, at, at n equals 4. So you have 2, 4, 8, and we had 14. So I'll put that in red, 14. Okay. For the 1D positive ray, the growth function is n plus 1. So we had 2, 3, and immediately at 3, uh, uh, at two data points, we're broken. Okay. Actually, we can continue. So we're broken here, here, we're broken. Okay. And the 2D positive rectangle, okay, we showed that you can implement all dichotomies on a particular set of four points. So the growth function is 2, 4, 8, 16. And here we didn't actually compute it, but we know that it's less than 32. So a breakpoint is indeed 5. Okay. And in fact, when we look at the cheapest breakpoint, so the cheapest breakpoint is 4 here. And so the VC dimension, the VC dimension is um, three. Okay. The cheapest breakpoint is two here, so the VC dimension is one. Okay, and the cheapest breakpoint is five here. Okay, and so the VC dimension is four. And just for kicks, let me show you the number of free parameters. Sometimes people call this the degrees of freedom. That's a little dangerous. Let me just call it the number of parameters that you get to specify in order to pick a hypothesis from each of these sets. So the number of parameters. Okay. So, you know, if you're picking a 2D perceptron, you have to pick a hypothesis 
on this hypothesis set, you specify W0, W1, W2. You pick three parameters. If you're picking the 1D positive ray, you pick the threshold, and on the right of this threshold, it's positive, on the left, it's negative. So you've got to pick the threshold, so you get to pick one parameter. And for the 2D positive rectangle, you have to, so you have your positive rectangle, you have to specify the bottom left point and the top right point. That's one way to specify the rectangle, and inside is positive. So you have two coordinates here, two coordinates there, so you have to specify four coordinates. So you have four parameters to specify. Mm. Look at that. Seems to be a very nice correlation between the number of parameters and the VC dimension. And we are all familiar with the number of parameters in sort of, in, 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 in sort of the specification of a function as a natural way to capture the complexity of that function class. Okay. So for example, we'll say third order poly polynomials. So you have to specify, you know, the zero coefficient, one, two, three. So you have four coefficient to specify. And then you say the fourth order polynomial, you have to specify five coefficients and that's more complex. Okay. So the VC dimension, seems to correlate with the number of parameters, except it turns out that it, it can deviate wildly from the number of parameters. For some, so for some, you know, simple hypothesis sets, yes, but once you get to more general hypothesis sets, no. Okay. So in particular, there exists, there are H with one, with one free parameter, so in other words, to pick a hypothesis from that hypothesis set, you just specify one parameter, but DVC is infinity. Okay, there are H, H with many parameters, and DVC is one. Okay, and you might wonder, well, how is this possible? Well, you know, uh, this is a this this you 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 can look in the problems in chapter two, and we actually spell out how to pick a hypothesis set that is parameterized by one parameter, and, we can, and, 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 you can, and, and you can prove that no matter what the data set size, I can arrange the data so that I can shatter them. That's amazing. Okay. And so, even though this has one free parameter, its VC dimension is infinity, and the theory says we cannot guarantee, we cannot guarantee that you will, you will have the link from E in to E out, okay? because our, our guarantee has to hold, you know, for any scenario, okay, and and that's why it, it and and that that's what's that's one of the beauties of the theory. It's completely general. Now you can build much more sophisticated theories and make more stringent assumptions, but that limits how you can apply the theory. This theory can be applied anywhere. Okay, so and you know it's easy to construct hypotheses sets with many parameters, but. Their, DV, their effective complexity, their VC dimension is very small, okay, and that just means that you have lots of redundant parameters, okay, so you can sit down and figure out how to do that. But the point is that, you know, this is just to show you that, hey, this uh, measure of complexity is not completely wild. It has some familiarity with, you know, what we knew before, okay, but it can deviate a lot, and that's the right measure, not the number of free parameters, because you cannot put the number of free parameters in here, Okay, you cannot put the number of free parameters in here, but you can put the VC dimension. Okay. So, four hypothesis sets which have bounded VC dimension, okay, bounded as in not infinity, so finite. We can write, rewrite this error bound or, 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 or capture the essential dependence of this error bound on the important parameters. This error bound is, is O of the square root of dvc log n over n and so that's an important dependence to sort of have in mind okay that um if you increase let's say you double the vc dimension you pretty much need to double the size n in order to get a comparable link between e in and e out okay and um that is something that holds in practice okay. if you and, 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 and the VC dimension being the complexity of the hypothesis set, if you increase the complexity of the hypothesis set, you have to increase n. And this gives a quantified way in which you have to increase n in order to maintain the same error bar. Okay. Um, let me give you an example of a non-trivial hypothesis set, I mean, of a relatively simple hypothesis set that does indeed have an infinite VC dimension. So complex sets, so positive complex sets, positive complex 
uh, positive convex sets. I don't know why I said complex. Okay. Positive convex sets. So a convex set is a set such that, you know, if you take any two points in the set, the line between those two points is contained in the set. I claim that if you give me any value of n, I can arrange those points and shatter them. Okay, so let's take n equals 5, for example. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put those points on a circle. Let's say equally spaced. Now give me any dichotomy you want. For example, you know, you give me plus. Uh, uh, you, you give me the dichotomy um, plus, plus, minus, plus, minus. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. So remember, if, if, I'm, if I'm thinking about, you know, convex sets, well, the... the the typical convex set is a convex polygon. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to construct a polygon whose vertices are constructed as follows. So, you know, imagine a circle, okay? And I'm going to take the first vertex of my polygon to be slightly outside the circle above this point, okay? Slightly outside the circle above this point. Slightly inside the circle uh, below this point. Slightly outside here, slightly inside here, okay? And now join these, you know, join these uh, points and because they all started on a, on a circle, as long as the perturbations are small enough, the, con the polygon that results is going to be a convex polygon. Okay, and look, the two negative points are outside and the positive points are all inside and boom, I've accomplished it. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind a proof that no matter what data set size you give me, I can arrange them on a circle okay, and shatter them. So convex sets, DVC, DVC, for positive convex sets is infinity. Okay, so here we have some relatively simple, you know, hypothesis sets, not the kinds that we're likely to use in practice. Here's a, 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 a slightly more complicated hypothesis set in the same sort of vein as the 2D positive rectangle. It's the 2D convex set. And this guy, okay, has a... Um, VC dimension that's infinity, so it's not of much use to us for learning. Okay, so are there, you know, normal popular hypothesis sets that have a finite VC dimension? Okay, and we can use such hypothesis sets to learn. And the answer is yes. Okay, and the first one that we will consider is our friend, the perceptron. Okay, so the perceptron, perceptron, so remember h of x is the sign of w transpose x, how many free parameters, so you have w0, w1 to wd, so d plus 1 free parameters, okay, and indeed theorem, okay, the VC dimension the VC dimension, so DVC for the perceptron in D dimensions is equal to D plus 1. Mm. Nice. Okay, it's equal to the number of free parameters. And it's it's pretty much, it's pretty small, and it's 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 pretty much you know the best you could have expected. If you, if you are in D dimensions, because if you're in D dimension, if you have any non-trivial hypothesis set, it, 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 it's going to have at least D parameters that you need to specify in order to specify its behavior in each dimension. Okay, so you can't really get away with less than a, a complexity of D, and the perceptron achieves this D plus one, you know, complexity. Okay, so what, so the error bar is, is basically related to the dimension. So for the perceptron, E out of G is linked to E in of G plus, you know, order of the square root of the dimension times log N over N. That's nice. Okay. So if you, if you have more and more features, then to effectively learn a perceptron, this is what the theory is telling you. If you have more and more features, in other words, you're going into higher and higher dimension, 
To effectively learn a perceptron, you need more and more data to keep control of this error bar. And we can tell you, we can, we can quantify how much more we need. Okay? So proof. So this is a deep result. So in fact, not only is the perceptron the model that you know I'm recommending, but uh, it's part of what what's called what we what we're going to call the linear models. But you know all other complex models are built from the perceptron, like neural networks. So it's just a very fundamental model, and it is a good hypothesis set. In particular, it's a very good hypothesis set because you know the VC dimension is small. Okay, it's small and gives you a very tight link between e in and e out. So if you can get E in close to zero with the perceptron, BAM! You have learned. You have learned well. It's only when you have to go more and more complex than the perceptron in order to get E in close to zero that you need to start getting worried. Okay. All right, so the proof. Ah, I've done enough theory already. Okay. So this is left as an exercise for the, for the reader in particular. It's gonna appear as one of the exercises on your homework. But I'm going to give you some hints. So we need to prove that the VC dimension, dVC, is equal to d plus 1. Well, you know, I'm suggesting that you do this in two steps. So we can do this in two steps. The first step is to show that the VC dimension is at most d plus 1. And then to show that the VC dimension is at least d plus 1. Okay, and if you can show that the VC dimension is at most d plus 1 and it's at least d plus 1, okay, then, um, well, basic math, it has to be equal to d plus 1. Okay. So let's discuss how we show these things. So remember, let me remind you, the VC dimension, dVC, is equal to the max number of data points that you can shatter. Okay, so to show that the VC dimension is at least d plus 1, you have to show that the max number of data points that you can shatter is at least d plus 1, which means that you can, it suffices to show that you can shatter d plus 1 points. So you can, can shatter d plus 1 points. Okay. And does it mean that you can shatter any collection of d plus 1 points? No, you can shatter some collection of d plus 1 points. So it suffices to exhibit a single collection of d plus 1 points that H can shatter. So, in other words, it suffices to exhibit a single collection of d plus 1 points and argue that it's possible to choose the weights. So, and argue that for every dichotomy, so for every one of the 2 to the d plus 1 dichotomies, it's possible to choose the weights w such that you can implement that dichotomy. Now, because we're in this abstract d plus 1 dimensions, you have to make this argument mathematically, linear algebraically. Okay. Now, what about to show that the VC dimension is at most d plus 1? Well, here, okay. You have to sh so remember the DVC is the maximum number of data points that you can shatter. Okay, so we're claiming that you, the maximum number of data points that you can shatter is at most d plus one. Well, what does that say about d plus two points? It says that d plus two points cannot be shattered no matter how you arrange them. So you cannot shatter d plus two points no matter how you arrange them. Okay, that's what it means. And so in order to show this, this is tough. You're going to have to dig deep into your linear algebra vault to show this. Okay, so you have to show that, you know, you, you, have, to, you have to sort of play an adversarial game. The best way to show this is to play an adversarial game. Give me any d plus 2 points. So give me any d plus 2 points. And now show that you can construct a dichotomy that's provably not implementable. Okay, so given any d plus 2 points, show that or construct a dichotomy that is provably 
not implementable. In other words, you know, given any d plus two points, because you have to make your argument general, that's why this is a harder thing to prove. Here you just need to find a specific d plus one points that can be shattered. Here you have to show that no matter how you choose d plus two points, okay, I will be able to find a dichotomy. Now that dichotomy might depend on the specific d plus two points, but no matter what d plus two points you give me, I will be able to find a dichotomy and prove to you that this type of function, no matter how you pick the weights, cannot implement it. It's a hard thing to prove. Okay. Like I said, it's going to dig deep into your vault of linear algebra. Okay. All right. So, you know, let's move on to sort of more practical, you know, sort of implications, uh, links between this, this theory, this generalization error bar, and what we, you know, what we will face when we actually face a machine learning problem. And I'm willing to spend, so, so this is the, you know, so we're going to now start discussing in more detail the approximation generalization trade-off. So first we'll look at how that's embedded in here, and then we're going to look at this other approach, which is the, so it's, it, which is the bias variance analysis. And that's because approximation versus generalization is so important, okay? because that's all there is in learning. Okay. That's all there is in learning. It's important to understand. That's all there is in learning. You can see E in, but that's no good to you unless you have the link to E out. And in building this link to E out, uh, uh, while also simultaneously trying to minimize E in, that's where this approximation generalization trade-off you know, surfaces. And it's there always. You cannot avoid it. So, the, so you had better head, you know, confront it head on and deal with it. Okay. And that's what we're going to discuss. It's embedded in here, and it's also you know, useful to have another way to look at it, which is called the bias variance analysis. Okay, so let's write the bound E out of G less equal to E in of g plus the square root of uh, 8 over n, the log of um, 4 times 2n to the dvc divided by delta. So I'm using the version of the bound with uh, the vc dimension and I'm, I'm ignoring the plus 1. Okay, so this we call omega of uh, dvc and n. Okay, and its essential dependence is O of the square root of dvc over n log n. So roughly speaking, you know, this contains the essential, you know, trade-off between the VC dimension, the complexity of your hypothesis set, and N. Okay. So if you double the VC dimension, you roughly speaking have to double N to get a comparable error bar. Okay. Now, you know, inside this uh, bound is, is uh, captured the approximation generalization trade-off. So if I, if on the x-axis, I plot the complexity of my hypothesis set measured by DVC and, you know, various errors. Okay, so then the ensemble error is dropping as you give me more and more complexity because I, I have, you know, more hypotheses to pick from, okay? And uh, the error bar, omega, is growing like the square root of the VC dimension, assuming that N is fixed, so this is omega. And the bound on the out-of-sample error, you know, displays this kind of behavior, where, you know, there's this optimal VC dimension, DVC star. Okay, and here's the trade-off, right? You know, you'd like to get E in small, Okay, because that's one of the terms, so you want to pick big DVC, but you'd like to get omega small as well, because you want the link from E into E out, so you want small DVC. And that trade-off that balances the ensemble error and the bound is the approximation generalization trade-off. How well are you approximating? How well are you generalizing? Okay, now, this results in sort of two modes of practice. The first mode of practice is, you know, that, um, you know, you have to pick a hypothesis set that, uh, achieves this trade-off. So for example, you have to pick a hypothesis set that's small, okay, at, while at the same time achieving a small uh, ensemble error. So this is just the expected behavior. You'd like to pick DVC. Now, a small hypothesis that achieves the best ensemble error, that's very simple. Here, pick the hypothesis set H, which has just one function, and what's that function? Can you guess it? Ta-da! It's the target function. Okay. Now, you will have ensemble error zero, or basically zero, if there's, if there's noise, but Essentially, ensemble error zero and the tightest possible link from E into E out, the single hypothesis Hofting bound. Okay, but if you're going to pin your hopes that you can pick a small hypothesis set like this, which contains the target function for any machine learning application you have, well, you're in the wrong business by lottery tickets. Okay, instead, you know, 
we are in the, in the we are in the world where n is fixed. Okay, and based on n being fixed, we we say what's the what's the link we want, and that you know fixes the VC dimension. So this fixes fixes dvc for example at dvc star and now the goal of the machine learning the machine learner the machine learning expert consult with the domain expert you know think 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 okay i've got i've got this much flexibility in the choice of the hypothesis set so i can choose that level of complexity so what's the best hypothesis set for the problem for the machine learning task okay in other words you're trying to get to this you're trying to get as close as you can to this kind of a hypothesis set but within this level of complexity with this with this fixed vc dimension Okay, so that's, uh, you know, that's one of the, the inputs that the machine learning expert, expert can bring. The other mode in which you might find yourself, and, you know, is, is and this is generally rare, rarer because usually the data set is fixed, your client gives it to you. But, you know, you might be very, very stubborn and say, you know, I have my favorite hypothesis set, and that's it. You know, I'm using this hypothesis set. So you have your favorite H. Now, we don't usually, you know, have the luxury to be stubborn like this. You know, my favorite hypothesis, I'm going to use a deep neural network no matter what, no matter what, no matter what. Okay. So, I have my favorite H, and that implies, and that comes with a DVC. So, in other words, DVC is fixed. Okay. And now, you need to ensure the first step of learning, E in close to E out. And so, that means that this error bar has to be within some tolerance that you have set. And so that means that you have to go and then tell your client, listen, I'm going to use deep neural networks or whatever it is that's your favorite hypothesis set. I'm going to use this. And I need this many data points to succeed. Why? Because I need E in close to E out. Okay. So you fix your VC dimension and then you pick N to get E in approximately equal to E out. And this approximately is set by you. Okay. And this picking of n is, is sometimes, you know, denoted the sample complexity for your hypothesis. And how big an n do you need? Sometimes it's called the sample complexity. Okay. And, uh, okay, so let me, let's go through uh, some examples of that. So, examples. Examples. Okay, so, uh, rewriting this bound. Okay, we have that, uh, so we have that the error bar, let's call that epsilon is equal to the square root of 8 over n uh, log of uh, 4 over delta times 2n to the dvc. Okay. Now, you're going to pick your tolerance and you'd like to find out what n is. So we'd like to rearrange this so that we have n on the left hand side. So n is equal to 8 over epsilon squared. I squared and pulled n over there uh, log uh, times dvc. So log of this thing is dvc log 2n. Okay, and then we have plus 8 over epsilon squared log of 4, de 4 over delta. Okay, and now let's put in some reasonable value. So, uh, reasonable tolerance for epsilon is, let's say, 0 0.1. For delta is, let's say, 0 0.1. That means that you're making statements with 90% 90, 90 confidence, 90% that they'll be true. And this is the, the link that you would like to have between E in and E out. In this case, N um, is approximately equal to... You know, 800, so 1 over epsilon squared is 800, so 800 dvc log 2n, okay, plus 800 log 4 over delta, which is uh, approximately 800 dvc uh, log 2n, plus uh, 800 log uh, 40, uh, 800 log, log of 40 is about 4, let's say, so this is about 3,000. Okay, and you know, typically you don't expect to be needing more than uh, e to the 10 or, or 2n will not need to be larger than e to the 10. So maybe we can approximate this by 10 in the worst case. So n is approximately equal to 8000 dvc plus uh, 3000. Okay, approximately. Um, and indeed, okay. Um, what, the, what is this saying? This is saying that the number of data points you need is proportional to the VC dimension. And the proportional, proportionality constant is approximately 8,000. Okay. Now, um, uh, you can actually go ahead and you know, solve this equation for n. This is not actually an equality. This is not an equation that tells you n because there's n on this side. So how would you solve this? Maybe we plug this in as an estimate. So let's try an example. dVc equals 3. So this guy here is approximately 27,000. That's our guess. 
you have approximately 27,000. So plug in 27,000 into the right hand side and you'll get a new value for n, maybe 29,000. Okay, that's your next guess goes to an, a new guess goes to an, and then plug that new guess in here, you'll get a new guess. And, and this rapidly converges. That's an example of what's called a fixed point iteration. This will rapidly convert to n is approximately 30,000. So our, our starting estimate was not too bad. Okay. DVC equals 4, you know, you can, you get the estimate N is approximately equal to 35,000. And when you plug in the iter fixed point iteration and, and iterate and converge, you'll get approximately N is about 40,000. Okay, and if let's try DVC equals 5, you'll get N is approximately 50,000. Okay, so let's see what we're saying. So if your favorite hypothesis set has a VC dimension of 3, for example, the perceptron in two dimensions, Okay, the perceptron in two dimensions has VC dimension three, then you need 30,000 data points in order to you know, effectively learn that perceptron. What does that mean? In order to, to get your link between E in and E out of just a 10% link. So if, if your E in was 0 0.1, your E out could be as bad as 0 0.2. Okay. Well, it turns out that that's a gross overestimate. Gross, gross. If anyone here has, you know, done any, has any experience with learning perceptrons or learning linear models in two, three, small number of dimensions, you, you know that you need, you know, order of 100, 200, maybe 1,000 data points, not 30,000. Okay. So, in, in practice, so rule of thumb. Okay. So, in practice, this dependence on DVC is generally speaking correct, that it's linear. So, if you double the DVC, you need double the, the amount of N, and you already saw that here. But, you know, you don't need, ten, you don't need uh, uh, 10,000 times the DVC. In practice, 10 times the DVC is all, often enough. You know, N is approximately 10 times DVC, enough. N is approximately 100 times DVC, safe. Okay. And N is approximately equal to a thousand times DVC, you know, golden. Okay, so that's, but, 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 but these are just, this is just a rule of thumb, okay. can't prove it. What the VC theory says is you need 30,000. Okay, and so there's a big difference in that sense between, you know, what the VC theorem is, 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 is suggesting and what happens in practice. Okay, and we, when we initially said that, you know, the VC theorem, we're covering it because it's relevant to practice. So let's discuss a little bit the, the theory versus practice when it comes to the VC theory. Theory versus practice. Okay, so theory. The VC theory is general. Okay. And that's the relevance to practice. I need, I, don't, I need to say nothing more. It's general. Any target function, any hypothesis set, any algorithm that picks a hypothesis, any data generating process, P of X, that generates your data. Completely general. And there you have the relevance to practice. You can use this theory for any machine learning setting. Okay. Now, let's look a little bit at, you know, wh where this difference between what the VC theory is saying and what, you know, we generally tend to observe in practice. Where's that slack coming from? So let's call that the slack. So where does the slack come from? Okay, it's essentially coming from the fact that we built a theory that's so ultimately general, but let's pin it down. Okay. So I'm going to uh, point out three main contributors to the slack. The first was, you know, the Hofding bound plus union bound. Hofding plus union bound. Okay, so what was this doing? What was what, what essentially this did was it said, you know, you give me a G and all I need to know is that it is from your fixed hypothesis set H. Okay, so, and then that holds for that G. Effectively, what I'm saying is that no matter what hypothesis you picked from your hypothesis set, this bound holds. So effectively, I'm, I'm saying that this bound holds for every hypothesis in your hypothesis set. Okay. And you might think, well, that's really overkill because, you know, maybe I don't use those other hypotheses very often. Well, then why did you put them in there? The moment you put them in your hypothesis set, the Hofting bound says, well, I mean, the, the analysis says you might pick it. And so I've got to tailor my bound to accommodate the fact that you might pick that hypothesis. Okay. So this holds for all the hypotheses in your hypothesis set. And that's what allows us to make this claim independently of your algorithm. Because no matter what your algorithm does, no matter what final hypothesis it gives, the bound holds. So this makes it for any algorithm, okay? 
and any hypothesis set within that that you can construct. Okay? And uh, for any algorithm, for any particular hypothesis set. Now, where's the, there's, the, there's another place where slack occurred, which was, you know, in the definition of this M sub H of N. Okay, the Lagrange function. So let's think about how we define this guy. So the hypothesis set is now entering here, but the discussion holds for any hypothesis set. But what was this guy? It was the, the, the ingenious step was to say, we should look at the complexity of a hypothesis set through the lens of a data set, but which data set? Okay, and that's where we said, well, we don't know what data set we're going to get. So take the worst possible data set. Take the data set for which the number of dichotomies is maximized. Okay, so this was, you know, the maximum. So worst case, number of dichotomies. Mm. Well, why did we do that? Okay, so because we don't know the data set. And so we built in this redundancy, this, this ability to tolerate any data set. And that gives us the ability to tolerate any data generating process, any P of X. So in here is embedded the any data generating process. So for any P of X. So we have to build in, we don't know what P of X is and that we don't know, we don't know. We, we just get the data, we don't know P of X. Okay. So we have to tolerate any P of X. Okay, then. You know, we now need to analyze this guy. So we bounded this guy is, you know, less equal to B of N and K, okay, which is less equal to, okay, so N, N, and which is less equal to N to the DVC plus one, okay. Now, there's a little bit of mathematical slack here, technical slack, okay, so I'll call that technical slack, okay, but the real slack is in here. Okay. And what is that slack? What that slack is, is, is it saying, you know, I, I don't know how to analyze this guy. This is a hypothesis set with breakpoint K. So I'm going to, I'm going to look at the maximum number of dichotomies that you can list without shattering any subset of size K. So in some sense, I'm looking at the worst possible hypothesis set with a breakpoint K. So this considers, you know, assumes that the hypothesis set can Im implement that maximum number, whereas in practice it might not be able to. It's just got a breakpoint at k. This is the this is and it's just some hypothesis set which implements a small number of dichotomies. But we are bounding that small number of dichotomies by the worst possible number of dichotomies, the maximum number of dichotomies with that breakpoint. So this, in some sense, you can think of this as the worst possible h with breakpoint. DVC plus one. So lots of worst possible, and this is what allows us to make this claim for any H. So here in is built for any H. Okay. And what about where's the for any F? Well, the analysis didn't make any assumptions, assumptions on F. F will come in when you compute the in sample error. It's what's generating the data. So you see, to tolerate these for any, we have to, you know, build in slack that accounts for any algorithm, any data distribute any data distribution any h okay and that slack is what is showing up in this number 30000 okay and what it means is that and is it real is it real is it realizable basically yes okay so what it says is that there are machine learning problems with dvc3 where you can you know carefully construct the the probability distribution and the hypothesis set and you know and 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 the algorithm such that if you learn in that adversarial setup, you will need 30,000 data points to make this 0.1 link. Okay. But in practice, we don't see those, you know, craftily constructed machine learning situations. That's why in practice, there's a lot of slack and 100 times DVC is what I recommend. Okay, so that constitutes our study of the VC theory. And, you know, it, ult it ult ultimately, you know, there are two basic uh, uh, realms in which it applies. The first is that, you know, you need to you have n is fixed, and so you, you have a DVC that is required in order to get the, the link between in and e out, and you need to choose the right h with that DVC. And the other realm is DVC is fixed, and you ask your client for the appropriate n, uh, uh, choose n. And the VC theory em embeds this approximation versus generalization trade-off. Okay, so you, like you need to approximate the data, but link from E into E up. And this approximation generalization trade-off is so fundamental, it's always there, it's always there. As a machine learner, you always have to deal with it. It's worth you know, spending a little more time looking at it from another perspective, and that perspective is gonna be the bias variance, uh, bias variance analysis. Okay. And so, 
It's just another way to look at this trade-off, okay, because it's such an important trade-off. Okay, so we'll erase the board, and then we will be back. Okay, so let's talk about bias and variance, which is another view of approximation versus generalization. Okay, so the bias, variance, analysis. Okay, and you know, let, let me contrast this a little bit or show you how it's related to what we just did, which is what's called the VC analysis, which gave us this generalization error bound that links E into E out. So in the VC theory, okay, there were two important quantities, which were, which was E in, you know, how well did you fit the data? Okay, and then, you know, so that's that's one aspect of the trade-off. You'd like to get that low. And then there was the E out versus E in issue. So E out is approximately equal to E in. So how how close is what you did do? How close is what you see? Is what you did to E out. Okay, and what you did you can measure. Okay. Now, the bias variance analysis, sort of similar but different. So, instead of E in, instead of how well did you fit the data, we can look at, you know, a, a specific problem and, and ask the question, you know, how well can you fit the data? So How well can you fit? Not how well did you fit, but how well can you fit? Okay, so in some sense, you know, um, there's, there's some, some, some deviation between, you know, the hypothesis set and the target function. Okay. So imagine that, you know, the target function is living here and there's your hypothesis set with a bunch of hypotheses and dot, each dot is a hypothesis. Okay. And in some sense, you know, there's some best hypothesis. Okay. So in, in some sense, okay, in some sense. Okay, and this is roughly speaking how well you can fit the data. And, and, and this is what we call the bias. Okay, so this is the bias. How well can you fit the data? Okay, but then, you know, similar to the question of, you know, how well, how close is what you did to what you care about, which is E out. So this is how well you can fit the data. Okay, that establishes a bias. But then you now also need to find this guy. Okay, so how well can you find the best guy? Okay, so how easy is it to find this, you know, uh, sort of, you know, best function, in some sense, best function, the best function. And what do we mean by that? Well, what we mean by that is, well, there exists sort of how well you can do, okay, but now you have to find it. And the only thing that you have that allows you to find this guy is the data set. So when you, when you generate a data set, okay, when you generate a data set, you know, you'll try to go to the hypothesis in your hypothesis set that looks best on the data set. So it might be this guy, okay. And, you know, on another day, if you generated another data set, the guy, the hypothesis that looks best is this guy, and then this guy, and then this guy, and so on. Okay. So any particular data set is going to result in not finding the best that you can do, but finding what whatever you happen to do on the data set. So, so depending on what data set is generated, there's variance in what you output. You'll not usually be outputting this sort of hypothetical optimal guy that, you know, uh, accomplishes the best you can do. Okay, but now, so this is a sort of a, a heuristic picture of what's going on. So there's some variance around that best guy. Okay. And you can now, we can already start to sort of think that, you know, the larger a hypothesis set. So if I make my hypothesis set larger, okay, now the best I can do is F. So then the bias drops to zero for larger hypothesis sets. Okay. But now that the hypothesis set is larger, if I have a, you know, a given small data set, 
Now, you know, uh, uh, on any given day, if I generate a small data set, you know, the, uh, there's going to be something that gets zero, and that's something that can get zero, and another guy gets zero, and zero, and zero, and zero. And so for a small enough data set, I'm going to be going all over the place in this hypothesis set. And so it's even though the best I can do is, you know, close to the true target function, it's very hard for me to find that on the basis of a, of a small data set. And so that's this variance at play. Okay. So let's quantify that. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to sort of illustrate all the ideas with a, just a simple example. And then we'll, you know, see some experiments and, and, and we'll summarize. Okay. So let's consider, you know, and it's, it, okay. So, so before, before we consider the example, let me just mention that, you know, you know so this is a beautiful general theory. Okay. This bias variance analysis, the first limitation is that, um, it only applies to squared error, so which which includes the classification error as a special case. So what do we mean by squared error? So you measure you measure the the error between you know h of x and y, which is f of x, by you know h of x minus f of x squared. So in classification, you know, the classification error is related to the squared error because, you know, if you take the squared difference between plus one or minus one, when they're equal, the squared difference is zero. And when they're not equal, it's four. Okay, so it's proportional to the squared error. Um, so, so bear in mind that our discussion applies only to the squared error, but then people like to, you know, use this sort of heuristic analysis that says that, you know, it, it's good to reduce the bias uh, if you if reducing the bias amounts to sort of improving the best hypothesis in your hypothesis set. So generally speaking, increasing the size of the hypothesis set and, 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 and reducing your variance is sort of reducing how, you know, how, how, um, how wild in some sense, the, the hypothesis that you do output, the final hypothesis that you do output is on the basis of a finite data set. Okay, so this heuristic analysis can be sort of thought of as valid in general, but technically, the mathematically, the bias variance analysis applies to squared error, but there is a good news. Okay, so it can take into account, into account, the algorithm. A. Okay. What that means is that, you know, the same hypothesis said with different algorithms can result in a different bias and a different variance. Okay. And uh, to contrast with the VC analysis, the VC analysis applies to any algorithm. So it had to be necessarily loose. So sometimes the bias variance analysis gives us a slightly sharper view of what's going on in this approximation generalization trade-off because it can take into account the algorithm. And you can imagine why it's important to take into account the algorithm to get better bounds, because suppose your algorithm is kind of stupid and it always picks hypothesis H1. Okay. The VC analysis doesn't know that, so it gives you a bound for the whole hypothesis set. But effectively, your hypothesis um, is just H1. Your effective hypothesis set is just H1, so, you know, H1, and, and so it has a huge bias. But very little variance, in fact, zero variance, because, you know, you know, when you vary the data set, there's no change to the hypothesis that you output. Okay. And so this analysis can take that into account. So let's consider an example. Okay. The example is a very simple example. Okay. So imagine that, you know, I have a target function, and I'm going to put the target function in red. Okay. Okay. And I'll draw it twice. Okay. And you'll see why soon. So I have a target function. And I'm going to I'm going to draw it twice. Okay. And imagine that I have a data set of size two. So I'm going to generate a data set of size two, and I'll generate it twice. So it's not that I'm I'm, I'm doing the experiment twice. I'm just uh, repeating the drawing of the same experiment twice. And now this is where the two experiments are going to change. Okay. I'm going to now have a particular hypothesis set, which is you know, lines. So I'm going to, so this is a, it's easier to dis describe the, you know, the concepts in the context of regression. And so we're, we're doing regression, not classification. So think of this as, you know, mm, this is F of a one dimensional variable X and this is X. So this is F of X and this is X. 
Okay, and now you know I'm going to I'm going to try to use this data to learn a, 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 a final hypothesis a, 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 a G that approximates F. But now I need to tell you what the hypothesis says. So I'm going to consider H uh, zero, which is just flat lines. So lines with zero slope. So the only thing I get to do is change the level of the line. Okay, and then here I'm going to have lines with slope h1 equals lines with slope so if i look at the number of available parameters here i just get to pick one parameter which is the level so one parameter and here i have a line where i get to pick a, a, a slope and an intercept so i have two parameters so just to illustrate you know, the, the learning problem in, in this regression setting with two different hypotheses sets. They're very simple hypotheses sets, and I've chosen them uh, so that one is clearly more com one is clearly more complicated than the other. Okay, so now what's a reasonable algorithm? Find a line that minimizes, since we're working with squared error, find a line that minimizes the squared error to the points. So a line is a function, you know, g of x, that's constant. So what's the constant that's going to minimize the squared error? It's the average. Okay, so if I learn with this data set, I'm going to output the average. Okay, so this is my g of x for this data set. Okay, and if I learn with that data set, well, since I have both, both you know, intercept and slope, I can fit the data exactly. Okay. All right. Now let's, uh, let's examine some sort of, uh, you know, properties of these two. So this is, let's call this g sub 0 of x and let's call this g sub 1 of x. Okay, so now, so that's, so that's what's going on in sample. Okay, now I generate a test point. I generate a test point x, let's say somewhere here. So I generate a test point x. Okay, and you know, now this guy is going to predict, so here's my test point x. Okay, so this guy predicts you know, g sub 0, so let's, let's just call this g 0 of x, okay, and this guy predicts, you know, um, uh, g, so this point here is g 0 of x, this point here is g 1 of x, okay, and this guy here is the error, okay, so what's the error? The error is f of x minus g 0 of x, squared, so that's the error, and here we have a much smaller error, it looks like, oh, fantastic. Okay. Um, um, so let's call this f of x minus g1 of x squared. Okay. So that's the situation that appears with, you know, a particular data set, you know, you fit, you fit, you get your final hypothesis, you predict, you predict, then you get two errors. Okay. Now I want to see what happens. Well, you know, the data set is random. And this is just one particular realization of the data set. And you can imagine that, you know, and it looks here that, oh, wow, you know, why would you ever go for the flat lines? Okay. Why not go for the lines with slope? Okay. So let's see what happens if, if I had generated a different data set. I'm going to make that data set blue. Okay. So here's a different data set. I'm going to generate that point and that point. It could happen by accident. Okay. I mean, the data set is randomly generated. You ge randomly generate x values. So that's this point and this point. Okay. Now, in this scenario, what's the function I learned? The, the flat line that, you know, sort of best approximates these two, i.e. its average, is somewhere here. Not too different. Okay, and approximately the same error. Okay. And the line with slope that fits this blue curve is this guy here. Wow, look at the big difference. Okay, look at the big difference. So now this error became huge. If I predict at this test point with this g1 of x versus this g0 of x, okay, here the error has stayed approximately the same, and here the error has suddenly become huge. Okay, so if we're going to analyze each of these hypotheses sets, okay, so which data set should we pick? There's no reason to pick this data set over that data set. We don't know what's going to uh, uh, arrive in practice. So we should analyze, in some sense, the entire 
random process of generating the data set followed by fitting, followed by computing the error on a test point. So we want to know what's the expected behavior with respect to data sets. Okay. So, let us analyze the expected behavior with respect to data sets. So expected behavior with respect to data sets. Okay, so here's the process. Okay, you generate a data set and it could have been either the bl black or the blue. So you generate a data set. And, and, and let's imagine that we, we generate multiple data sets. So we could have, in this case, we just generated two data sets. So you generate a data set, D1, D2, D3, up to D sub M. Okay. And then each of these, from each of these data sets, you would learn a different function. So, so you know, it, it, the blue or the black, but in general, for different data sets, you learn a different function. So let's call this, you know, G, okay. And in order to emphasize that I learned this from the data set D1, I'll call this G D1. So I'll use the superscript D1, okay, G D2. So we, we produce a different final hypothesis. Okay, and then we can now evaluate this final hypothesis on a test point. So we get G D1 of X. So imagine this test point is fixed. G D2 of X, G D3 of X, G D M of X. So I've generated M data sets. Okay, and now you can see that depending on the data set, I get different hypotheses, and then for each hypothesis, I get a different prediction on, on X. So we could ask, what's the average prediction? So the average prediction, let's call it G bar of X, is the average, though, is, is 1 over M, the sum from um, I equals 1 to M, G D I of X. That's the average prediction. Okay. And we know from, you know, uh, basic probability that this average, if we were to take this in the limit of large enough m, this is approaching, a a statistically approaching the quantity, which is the expected value over data sets. So this approaches the expected value over data sets of g d of x. So think of a random process where what's random? The randomness is coming from the data set. So you randomly generate data sets, you produce a hypothesis, you evaluate it at x, and now you compute the expected value with respect to the, the randomness, with respect to the data set. Similarly, we could be interested in the variance of the predictions. So let's call that the variance at x. Okay. And um, um, so this is equal to you know, the sum, so if, if I compute the variance of these guys, it's 1 over m, okay, the sum is the average of the deviations of each individual prediction from the average prediction. So it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the sum, it's the average of the deviations, okay, so g d i of x is the average of the deviations from between the actual predictions and the average prediction minus g bar of x squared and this is where the squared error comes in okay so this is the variance okay and okay as i take the number of data sets larger and larger this is just approaching the variance okay so it's the expected value so this is an average so it's the expected value over data sets of the quantity g d of x minus g bar of x squared. Okay, so this is the expected the expected prediction. This is the variance of the predictions. Okay, and now let's look at the the actual the error. Okay, the error. Okay, so the error the error the, the, the out-of-sample error, so out-of-sample error is, for each of these, is, you know, um, f of x minus g d i of x squared. Okay. 
That's the out of sample error for each of these. So we could ask, well, on average, what's the out of sample error for, you know, for this process that, you know, generated the data, then you picked the hypothesis, and this is where your hypothesis set and algorithm come in. And then we evaluated the hypothesis on a test, evaluated these hypotheses on a test point, and now we compute the average error. Okay, the average error is, is 1 over m, the sum from i equals 1 to m of the, 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 the squared differences between f and g. And again, the squared error is playing a role here. Okay? Now, this is a well-known fact from, you know, probability theory statistics that the average deviation between a constant, so f of x is a constant, okay, f of x is a constant, and g is what varies when you generate different data sets. Now, it's a well-known, so well-known that the average deviation between a random variable and a constant when you square it, okay, so the average squared deviation between a random variable and a constant is equal to the squared difference between that constant and the average value of the random variable. So this guy is equal to the squared difference, so it's equal to 1 over m, the okay, the, oh, sorry, it's equal to, it's equal to the squared difference between f of x and g bar of x, okay, so f of x, it's just a constant, it's the target value at this test point. What's, what's changing with i? Changing with i is your predictions. So the squared deviation, the average squared deviation is the squared deviation between the constant and your average prediction plus the variance in your predictions. That's a well-known fact from statistics, probability theory, and you can go and derive this if you want. I won't. You can see the derivation in the slides. You can see the derivation in the text. Okay, and this we call the bias, little bias, at x. Okay, the bias at x. Okay, it's the square deviation between your f of x and your g bar of x. And so we see that your out-of-sample error E out, okay, so theorem, I'll write this down now as a theorem, it's a decomposition of this error, so theorem, and I'm using a big word theorem, but we just derived it, theorem, okay, so this is your, this is your average out of sample error, so, and this for large enough m becomes your expected out of sample error. Expected with respect to what? Expected with respect to data sets. So your expected out of sample error, so the expected value of a data sets of the quantity f of x minus g d of x, so minus the hypothesis produced squared, so this expected error is equal to <coughs> f of x minus g bar of x squared plus variance of x, which is by definition the bias at x plus the variance at x. Okay, so this is called the bias variance decomposition. It decomposes your expected out of sample error in terms of a bias plus a variance. Expected out of sample error where? At test point x. Okay. If you want, you could average this over test points. Okay, so you could take the expected value over test points. Okay, and now Okay, we have to take the expected value of this side over test points. Okay, and we have to take the expected value of this guy over text, test points. And since the expected value of a sum is a sum of expectations, this is the expected value of the bias of x. That's called the bias. Plus the expected value of the variance as a function of, plus the expected value of the variance over x plus the variance. And this you can think of as defining an expected out, expected, E out, okay, and expected with respect to your data sets and your test point. So this is data sets and your test point, okay, and so this is a theorem. It says, okay, that your out-of-sample error your expected out-of-sample error is composed of two terms. 
The first is, is related to how, you know, close is your average learned hypothesis to the target function. And typically, you know, your average learned hypothesis is going to be very close to the best you can do. For linear models, yes, but in, in, in general, maybe not. But, you know, more or less, this is capturing how well can you do. And then this is the variance of x. Is saying that, you know, even if you can do well, you, there's so much variance that you can't get there very often. Okay, so that's what this is saying. It's saying that you can't get there very often. So it decomposes the error in terms of how well can you do and how easy is it to find that guy. Okay, and so, you know, just by looking at this picture, it suggests that, you know, this guy can't really do well. The flat lines can't, can't really do well. But they're consistently not doing well. So the bias will be large, but the variance is also, but the variance is small because, you know, not much variance in terms of when you generate the data sets. On the other hand, this guy, you know, might be able to do well if you get the right data set. So in, in, in principle, it can do well. So you would expect the bias to be small. Okay. But as illustrated by these two data sets, you know, the variance is huge. Okay. So let me show you some real experiments and then we'll conclude. Okay, so and, 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 and an interesting question arises, which hypothesis set should you use? Okay, so which hypothesis set you should use is the one that minimizes this sum. Okay, and there's the trade-off. Okay, so the hypothesis set on the left, which is simpler, has a larger bias, smaller variance. The hypothesis set on the right which is more complex, has a smaller bias, but larger variance. Trade-off, approximation, generalization, trade-off. Okay. And let's see this in action. Let me show you some pictures with some real experiments. Okay, so you know, for the scenario on the board with two data points, you know, and H0 and H1, I generated many data sets. Okay. And what we see here on the left is you know, H0, which is constrained to use flat lines, and the flat lines vary to follow the data sets, but that's about all they can do. On the right, we have the, two, the same data sets, the same data sets, okay, but now the wild, the lines that fit those data are wild, and you can convince yourself that depending on where the data set, the two points in the data set are, and we generate them randomly, so, you know, depending on where those two points are, you know, the, the, wild, the lines can produce these, this wild assortment of, of, of fits, okay. And, you know, it, uh, so on the left, you can't really you can't really approximate well, so the bias is large, but the, the hypotheses are constrained, and so the predictions have low variance. They're bad, but with low variance, and that's you know that's seen by the bias being 0.5, and the variance is small at 0.25. On the right, you know you get on average a better fit, which is corresponding to the fact that the the line width slope can fit the blue target function better. Okay, so the bias is significantly smaller at 0.21. But the variance, okay, the variance of the predictions are huge and, and, and 1.69. And the theorem tells us that the out of sample error is the sum and that's the trade off, okay. And in this particular case, H0 wins. Ta da! Okay, so the simpler model wins by virtue of the fact that it controls the variance. Now, let's look at what happens on the right where I increase the number of data points to five data points. The H0 look, seems to be behaving similarly, okay, so it's still constrained by the fact that it has to use flat lines, so it can't approximate that well, okay, but because we have five data points, the variance has also dropped a little bit, okay, because what happens, the additional data points, the additional three data points now further constrain the, the line that you can output because the average of five data points is much more stable than the average of two data points, and that's seen in the variance also dropping. Okay. But the bias stays approximately the same because, you know, the bias is roughly speaking capturing what you can do and on average it doesn't approximate well. Still 0.5, the variance is, is, is lower by point, it is lower to 0.1, okay, and so when you take the sum, 0.6, okay, but now H1, okay, the bias is approximately the same. You, you, on average you can approximate just as well, so the bias is 0.21, but now look at the variance, these extra five points that came are constraining the, the, the hypothesis on and, and, and giving on average low variance predictions. And so the variance dropped to 0.21 and now E out is 0.42. So H1 wins. So if you were, if you were to, if you were to ask me which hypothesis set is better, it depends on the number of data points. And you can, and you can view it through this bias variance approximation versus generalization trade-off. Okay. Now you might ask, well, aren't those wild lines 
that appeared on the left with two data points, aren't those also still possible? What if all five data points are over here? Shouldn't you also see that? Well, that's just very unlikely. That's the point. Okay. So with, with, and, and that's what variance cap captures. It's a, it's a statistical quantity that captures on average the variability and the, and the bias captures on average the approximability. Okay. So for the average data set, what, what, what happened with your hypothesis? Okay. So which hypothesis is better is not a well, which hypothesis set is better is not a well defined you know, is not a well-defined uh, 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 question because it requires you to, to specify n. But if we allow n to vary, then the, the types of behavior that you'll see are sort of typified in these two curves. So if you have a simple model, you know, when you have a small number of data points, okay, your in-sample error and out-of-sample error are comparable. And that's what the VC analysis says because you have, you have, you know, a simple model. And so there's not much you can do, but it's close to E out. When you, when you have a complex model, if you have a few data points, you know, your in-sample error will, will, will always be lower than for the simple model, but it, the out-of-sample error will be huge. Okay? And it's only when you get more and more data points that the in-sample error and out-of-sample error, you know, converge, okay, and, and you get the smaller error bar, and then the out-of-sample error drops below the out-of-sample error of the simple model. So there is a, a number of data points above which you would choose the more complex model and below which you choose the simpler model. And let me end with just a comparison of the VC analysis and the bias variance analysis. Okay. So, you know, what does the VC analysis do? The VC analysis says that, you know, ultimately we care about E out. Okay. And what the VC analysis does, let's say for a given number of data points N, as I'm highlighting here with my arrow, it says that, you know, when you, when you, when you approach this uh, problem with N data points, you're going to observe an in-sample error of E in. And then there's a generalization error bar that, you know, that, that, that relates that E in to the E out. Okay. And the in sample error grows as you improve, e, as, as, as you add more and more data points because you're adding more and more constraints that have to be fit by the hi fixed hypothesis set. So it's, it, you know, it's going to have to, in order to, in, in order to fit the new data points that you've added, it's going to have to give up a little bit of its fitting ability of the old data points. In, and on average, its ability to fit this additional information will drop. And so your in-sample error goes up. But simultaneously, your out-of-sample error goes down, okay, even though the in-sample error is going up because the generalization error bar compensates okay, and, and brings the out-of-sample error uh, closer and closer to the in-sample error. Ultimately, the generalization error bar goes to zero. Okay, the bias variance decomposition is slightly different, but accomplishes the same general idea. It takes your out-of-sample error and decomposes it into the sum of two things. Now, it's not looking at the in-sample error. It's looking at, you know, on average, what's the error? Or roughly speaking, what's, you know, how, how, how well can you do? Okay? And how well can you do is this black line here. So it says that your out-of-sample error is how well you can do plus the variance that gets you up to the out of sample error. And now the, the bias variance analysis is not a bound. It's an equality. That theorem is an equality. But unfortunately, we can't compute it. Okay, so it's useful for analysis of the approximation generalization trade-off, but we can't compute it because we don't know this, this blue point here, this, 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 this black line, which is how well can you do. Okay. And, and also we can't compute the variance in general. So we can't compute these quantities. It's just a useful breakdown of E out. The, the, the advantage of the VC analysis is we, we know E, we know E in. Okay. E in we can measure. And then the theory gives us this bound on the, on, on the, on the error bar. And so at least we can upper bound E out. So, you know, it gives us a, a concrete upper bound on E out versus a nice clean way to analyze the, 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 the out of sample error broken down into bias plus variance. Okay, and so uh, with that, I'll see you next lecture.